Aloha. Welcome to The Creative Life, brought to you by the American Creativity Association in collaboration with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Darlene Boyd, ACA Chair, and Phyllis Blees, ACA Association President, joins me in hosting today's show as we explore the secrets of top innovators with today's guest, Rosemary Rhine. Rosemary joins us from her home in Cuenca, Ecuador. Rosemary is a renowned award-winning author and internationally sought after creativity consultant. Originally from the United States, she has lived a creative life in Latin America for 15 years. Her passion is helping organizations and more than 100 global fellows from around the world develop a culture of innovation. Welcome, Rosemary, to The Creative Life. Perhaps the uh, best way to start off is if you would briefly tell us about this adventure you have with Innovation Minds and uh, in particular your role. Oh, well, aloha and congrats to the American Creativity Association. Now more than ever, we need creativity and innovation in our life. And thank you for inspiring the curiosity with this program. Well, my journey with Innovation Minds, I began as an in-person facilitator of creativity and innovation. And one of the frustrations I had was that innovation would happen in these once a year events. But in fact, innovation is needed every day in every way that we look at both business and life. So um, I was very fortunate to be invited to be one of the innovators interviewed by the team at Innovation Minds who had identified four blockers to innovation. What was stopping companies from being more innovative and developing a technology solution as we move into the era of AI and technology that would enable us to make creativity and innovation part of everyday workflow and particularly in the times that we live in and the hybrid world that many of us are working in. Phyllis. So, yes, Rosemary, you said you were asked uh, to be one of the consultants with Innovation Minds. Who are Innovation Minds? And, you know, how do we contact and be in contact with that group? And also, what is the foundation for the the four blocks to innovation. How did you discern what those four blocks are? Well, actually, Innovation Minds was formed. It was a Silicon Valley startup developed by the innovators at LinkedIn and PayPal who got together with their frustrations and created this organization that would have an end to end solution, not just idea management, but also how do you go from idea to implementation? So I was very thrilled to be one of not only the participants in terms of what was blocking us, but to be part of interviewing top innovators. What are these four blockers to innovation? And then to create a solution that's going to tackle that. So in fact, innovation is part of what we do in everyday workflow. And we can talk about those blockers, Phyllis, if you'd, if you'd like to. Yeah. So why don't you kick it off? Okay. Well, the first one I wanted to talk about is non-scalable process, which is uh, once and done or one hit wonders. Innovation does not happen in this one aha moment and doesn't happen with this one group. And we also have day-to-day -day work, so we should be innovating every day. So how do you create a system and framework so that it's incorporated, innovation is incorporated into daily workflow? in both the real and the virtual world. So blocker number one is you need to have a sustainable framework. You don't wanna be uh, have the future of a blockbuster that stopped with innovation with one product line and things are changing so rapidly, which gets to blocker number two, which is prioritizing today's work over tomorrow's ideas. And I always love to give resources to those that are watching, that are entrepreneurs, that are innovators. And right now online, you can find a 2022 Trend Hunter report that shows how the pandemic is radically changing how we think, how we learn, how we love. And it's so critical. We can't wait till we get through the pandemic. These changes are happening uh, fast and furiously. So for example, We've got the work from home culture to contend with. And by the way, people that work from home are not as motivated 
as those that are working in the office. So how do we engage with them? Uh, a second trend is artificial intelligence. How are you using artificial intelligence to engage uh, your customers with your brand? And the example that comes to mind is Ikea. You know, people are no longer going, many people are not comfortable with in-person shopping. So Ikea has an awesome uh, QR code that you actually go into your living room, you put the QR code, you take that magic blue sofa, you put it in your living room, your family does weightlifting and has fun interacting with the furniture. So how are you engaging with this new consumer who's uh, staying at home and prefers the safety and convenience of shopping from at home? And third, of course, is health and safety. How is your brand looking at health and safety? That's a trend that we really can't wait to think about how we're going to tackle that. So for example, not only are we going to see more physical safety in locations, but they even have innovative projects or products such as smart mirrors that you look in the mirror and the whole family gets the, their biometrics measured. The, the children have cartoons that they can brush their teeth longer because they're engaged with the mirror. So technology is changing at the speed of light as we become more health and wellness oriented. And the fourth trend, of course, is concern for our planet and taking care of our planet. How is your brand innovating? So not only are you creating innovative products like a Vietnamese company created a biodegradable mask made of coffee beans. I'm from Ecuador, so of course that appealed to my sensibility. But how is your company lowering your environmental footprint? So the second blocker is you can't afford to wait for innovation because things are changing so quickly. And the third showstopper or inhibitor that, that really was the foundation of innovation minds is lack of strategic alignment and sponsorship. If you don't have an executive sponsor to move this forward, it won't happen. Angel investors for entrepreneurs. And um, interestingly enough, the diversity of the team. One of the things we created at Innovation Minds is like a eHarmony profile. So we get diverse team members working on that innovation project, not people that are all thinking the same way through innovator profiles. And the fourth one, which I think everyone who is in business is thinking about today, is talent isn't engaged and motivated. And uh, you might reference in academic journals, the great resignation. Low estimates are 25% of us because we were staying put during the pandemic are going to be looking for new job opportunities. So how do we keep you engaged? So with all of those blockers in mind, we created an all-in-one solution that tackles engagement, that tackles how do you get the right people on the team? And by the way, make it simple. So you're not going to all these multiple platforms. You're not going to um, a Facebook and an Eventbrite, but you're actually combining everything in one piece of software, as well as in-person facilitation that makes it engaging and fun. What is it? I'm sorry, I, I, I know you have a question, Darlene, but you said you've got an all-in-one solution? Mm -hmm. That was my actually, question, actually. Oh. <laughs> Same thoughts. Both of us. <laughs> it won't innovate the rest of your lives, but the one thing it will do is it will make it seamless. So we have a tool that we provide to both small and large businesses. One client I recently worked with was Red Bull, in which you can have this combination of in-person as well as virtual engagement. So when you think about creativity and innovation, you think about post-it notes. Well, imagine if innovation was as engaging as a Facebook feed, for example, where you have innovation snacks and you're matched with individuals who have an interest in solving those challenges. By the way, one of the top motivators, how do you keep employees engaged during this hybrid time, is to give them a challenge to solve. They, people want a mission and want a purpose. So how do you engage that, that hybrid workforce? You get them engaged and use technology as a tool, but not the only tool. So we do in-person events as well. Wow, I, I just, I'm really excited about your examples. And uh, 
I had many things I hadn't thought about, but what comes to mind as I'm listening to you, uh, I was bringing myself back to thinking about just the idea of vaccination and um, some of the barriers that we received. Uh, so every day, the shifts in how vaccines would be distributed, for example, and the politics involved. Any comments that you might have for us? And oh, I am so happy that you have politics. That. Yeah, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, if you were in the US, you watched it on CNN, you probably watched it on BBC, Ecuador was listed as the worst place to be in the pandemic with bodies on the street and it was horrid and no vaccinations, no vaccines were available. Which is exactly why I thought you might be a perfect person to talk about this. It was such a challenging time. Um, my husband and I celebrated our combined 145th birthday virtually because we were in lockdown mode. But what I'm so thrilled to share is the power of creative problem solving and innovation. Last week, World Health announced that Ecuador is leading the world in vaccination rates. And they applied creative problem solving and process. I talked about a sustainable framework. This was a time during political transition as the US experienced, but we were able to accomplish this by looking at really innovative ways to actually use, for example, polling registrars to, to reach at-risk communities in rural areas. So um, I, I'm very pleased today, and let's keep our fingers crossed that we continue, that that is one practical example of how when you get head, heart, and, and, and mind connected and you apply creative problem solving, miracles do happen. What, what do you do in the process when, what do you do to come up against the showstoppers and the blockers when they're not moving, when those blockers, you think you've utilized all your strategies that you've mentioned, but yet you're still hitting a wall. How do you get through or above that wall? Any well, yeah, the, the, the walls still occur. For example, you have organizational change. I'm working with a client right now of a major corporation where there's change at the top. And so the focus on innovation can be challenging. I think our principles of change management, which are bite-sized chunks and progress, you need to show, I, I think about the example of an Uber. Why is it we're going to wait for an Uber? because we can see the car coming, right? I think when we think of innovation as, oh, this one big thing, it's a major initiative. We need to make these incremental increases and show employees that we're getting somewhere. Um, I will say that so important, um, I'm a big believer in applying creativity and allowing innovation and creative thoughts to thrive, which is why creative problem solving itself I think is a miracle because it stops us from premature evaluation of ideas through divergent and convergent thinking. But so important that um, we not only have that sustainable framework in place, but we make sure at the beginning of the initiative, which is why we do a lot of handholding uh, at Innovation Minds with clients to make sure they're going to be successful by having both executive sponsorship, in-person, as well as virtual touch points. And we always keep in mind the key motivation of individuals. Um, you know, not only are there very cool things that you can do, like virtual coffee houses and virtual wine clubs. I love that one, by the way, um, where they're setting bottles of wine to everyone and they're, they're finding unique and creative ways so that employees can play. So always keeping in mind that even though technology is an aid, it's always the heart of human connection. Well, if you would allow me be, before I ask uh, Phyllis to, to come up with her, her thoughts, because I'm sure she has many. Um, I don't want to leave your mention of creative problem solving uh, without bringing forth that there are many models for problem solving that we come across, but the models that, that I feel are bring most success are those that go repeatedly in the process from the creative to the critical. So in other words, you're going from creative thinking to critical thinking, creative thinking, then back again to critical thinking and reevaluating. Uh, I would assume you would agree. 
I absolutely would agree. And I think there is a marriage between creative problem solving and we've used design thinking and other, we have a thons framework, the Sharkathon, the Makeathon, cool names for different ways to get people engaged. But one component that I'm a big believer in is ideas need implementation. So one of the things we did at Innovation Minds is we made sure that ideas don't stop in the idea bank, that it sees its way through to project management and implementation. And one of my pet peeves has always been, how do we measure innovation? And so using employee engagement measures and other measures will help us kind of put a spotlight on the importance of innovation every day equal to that of productivity. Hmm. So you, between you, we're talking about creative problem solving and there's been years of a creative problem solving institute at SIPSI at the New York University at Syracuse. And when and our audience is hearing this and it's rolling off our tongues, well, we're talking about years of process and work. So if you look up online, just Google creative problem solving or CPS, we're not just using it generically. That's a term of art that embraces a lot of modalities for creative, uh, for generating creative ideas like um, and in, in you know brainstorming alliteration there's just there are there are very strategic and well thought through steps to this quote creative problem solving unquote yes, discipline indeed. and uh and we're we're jockeying around these terms because we're it it's our craft and uh, but i want to move to the personal side mm -hmm. and you talked about having creativity, one of the blocks is not using innovation every day, in an everyday way, but it's just kind of an annual event. And what are some of the secrets to embracing innovative habits and thinking on a daily basis? I know this is something you and your company have really spent time looking at. And if you could share that with the audience. For sure. And the global fellows I work with, um, you know, it goes back for me to there was a Harvard study on the power of the word because. And believe it or not, when you use that magic word, you increase retention from 60 to 93 percent. So, for example, if you have a teenager who won't clean up their room, uh, you just don't say, well, why do you what's what's the because for them? Not because I said so. That doesn't work but giving them a powerful motivator. So everything from filling out a form, tell me the why. So when I think about personal creativity, what is my personal why? Now, my husband and I have been married for 28 years. Um, we, uh, every year, uh, it probably looks kind of dorky, but we have a state of the marriage retreat. And we talk about 10, 10 and 10, 10 things we wanna be, say and do. And we have that as a framework at the beginning of the year. And sometimes we do things differently, but we, we have a discussion about what are those critical because points for us. Um, when, I teach speak, uh, when I teach global fellows how to speak English, it's not to speak English. It's what is the because behind that? Are they looking to work internationally, for example? So knowing your because, not only important in business, but yourself as well. I think another um, component that I think about is we talked about applying creative problem solving and trying to put a little bit of innovation in your life every day. Now, I authored Go Wild, Survival Skills for Business and Life uh, for Park University. And I went into the wilderness and became a wilderness expert and learned that there are five keys to surviving in business and life, which is the premise of the book. But one thing that was very important to me is my understanding of the power of nature and the nature of inspiration. So spending time with nature, I tell my clients those five minute vacations that you can spend, mind walks, all kinds of different techniques using nature as a tool. And then one, I know Darlene, you and I met at a Creative Problem Solving Institute conference, find your tribe. I am such a firm believer, even in COVID, I have found a way to find my tribe of five. You should have that individual who supports you, that individual who you have fun with, that individual who will call you out on your stuff and say, I'm not sure you're thinking you know, the right way on this. You should have that individual um, that 
in engages you and gives you new ideas. My I, one book I read recently was you become the five people you spend time with. I want to spend it with really cool people who will stretch my thinking and who think differently than I do. And of course, both of you realize in these days of political division, um, how magical is it that we can speak of two individuals with different thoughts and, 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 and discuss ideas, just as we're doing with Think Tech Hawaii. And when you mentioned tribe, I, I, I've been thinking about tribe quite a bit lately. And what I find intriguing when I think about my tribe is how we gravitate to each other um, uh, over the years. And, and as, as we often say about friends, you can talk to a friend from years ago and it's as if you never uh, broke away, you just take off where you've left off. And, and I think that is important about tribes. I find it interesting too that you, so, you suggest to have, I heard you correctly, five in your starting five. five. Yeah, at least a tribe of five. We yeah, have we have tribal five. meetings uh, virtually. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> so you are a wild woman. So <laughs> the, I, I think I personally find something intriguing about your adventurous life uh, that not only do you visit these places and I don't and live in them, I don't think you're there as a tourist. If if I understand what I've heard from you, you actually immerse yourself and become part of that culture. Could you suggest a couple of examples that that uh, you've done? I know in Costa Rica, it seems that it seemed that you had all kinds of excursions and adventures. For sure, and yes, we were pretty committed. Um, that we would not live in an enclave of, of expats. And we, we purposely and with intention, uh, not only do we take courses from the university here in Ecuador, even though Spanish is my second language, so there, there is a barrier there that you need to overcome. But we do try to not only mingle with international citizens who are residing here, but try to uh, go to local events, understand the culture, you know, my I've also done some recruiting for executives and I often say to them, you know, you have a real winning candidate if you find someone who's lived somewhere else in the world. There is something about living somewhere else, not as a tourist, but living somewhere else. And so many of the students that I'm working with are in the process of immigrating from Brazil to Italy because they have national Italian heritage, for example. Mm. And they're taking that jump, that leap because they want to live life as an adventure, a learning adventure. And as long as you're, you're ready to have embarrassing moments, <laughs> to have times where you uh, do not understand what is happening, and you can laugh about it. And um, you know, I, I, I often say to my students, if you can say two words in any language, you will survive. Please and thank you. Learn basic courtesies. And I have to say that one challenge I have had is when people who visit here or think about living here constantly make comparisons with their home country. Um, because I think when you make the move and if you are thinking about an international lifestyle that you need to embrace all that it is. Have you learned not to make that comparison yourself? How long did it take you to shed that? You know what I have to shed when I talk with my family back home and they see the pictures on Facebook of my amazing life and they say, but don't you miss it back home? And I, I kind of bite my tongue a little bit because there are so many things I love about this country and also the United States, of course, is my home country. I'll always be a US citizen, gave me opportunities and I still work with so many clients there. But um, I've learned to appreciate each culture for what it brings. And um, my, one of my teaching moments is never to make generalizations about women, men, populations, because it just doesn't apply. We're all unique, God-given creatures. It doesn't sound like you have any regrets, do you? Do you ever think of a regret now and then? I'm sure there are life regrets. At 28, I opened uh, and converted an 1840 historic building in Cape May, New Jersey, young and entrepreneurial. I had a half a million dollar SBA loan when I was 28 years of age, went on into business, made I'm sure mistakes along the way. 
But uh, I have to say that the decision to move to a foreign country, uh, particularly Latin America, was a blessing for us. But I always love to go home. I'm going to be, I, I, as soon as we're able to travel, um, I certainly will look forward to my own little creature comforts that I miss back in the U.S. Phyllis. Yes. Um, Rosemary, you've talked about working with innovation officers. That mm -hmm. sounds like a job title. And I think the audience would be really interested to know how do you become an innovation officer and who's hiring them? And if you are already one, what could you do better to to encourage other companies to add more of what you do? This is a whole new industry, is it not? It really is. And just yesterday, I was with a student in Saudi Arabia, uh, virtually, of course, and she just received her certification to be a chief innovation officer. And Dubai and Abu Dhabi, as you might be aware, have so many incredible innovations happening. And so she's working with a nonprofit to encourage uh, an incubator for entrepreneurs, modeling in part what Silicon Valley has done. You will find a lot of chief innovation officers in the Silicon Valley area. Um, but companies, I would encourage companies to reach out to us at Innovation Minds. Certainly we can, we can point you in the right direction, connect you with other innovation officers. We do a, a podcast with innovators and not only chief innovation officers, but um, almost like I, I might, at one point I had a business card for my dog called CFO, Chief Fund Officer. One and engagement, and it was, he, I got more clients by giving business cards out. Of my dog, I can tell you, but um, really, it's that it's that art of not only knowing the process of innovation. So I would explore that, um, and there are groups certainly online of of innovation officers, but really exploring how employee engagement is really at the heart of it all, because in the end, people are the ones powering the engine. Think, think, mahalo, as we say in Hawaii for that. And I'll turn it over back to you, Darlene. I think we're in the last gas. I would like to know more about what people do to become an innovative officer or be able to apply. And there is a blog on the library at Think Tech Hawaii of all of our shows on the creative life. And after each show there, you can add information and you can look there for ways to look up getting qualified and certified in creative problem solving. Uh, yeah. So I encourage people to look online after the show is over, but off to you, Darlene. Yes, and, and Rosemary, I, I, I really have enjoyed, as I always do, uh, hearing your repertoire and, and your advice and your suggestions. And uh, I do thank you for the time that you, you've given us. And I suppose, Phyllis, it might be helpful to mention to our viewers since we have talked about creative problem solving that in the next few shows coming up over the next two months, I believe we will have some of the heads of those uh, institutes that, that we somewhat referenced, uh, Gerard Puccio from Buff State with uh, the famous creative problem solving, overseeing the famous creative problem solving institute. So we would encourage our visitors to keep with us. And I, I think we might be able to uh, build our own little tribe here if we have that opportunity. So with that, thank you for joining us today for today's Think Tech Hawaii show, The Creative Life with Creativity Consultant guest, Rosemary Rhine. The primary takeaway from today's show is a, perhaps a better understanding of how to navigate through and override blockers to organizational innovation in business and in our personal lives. Join us in two weeks for the next show of The Creative Life Journey. On behalf of my colleague and host, Phyllis Blees and our guest, Rosemary, excuse me, Rosemary, Rosemary Ryan and myself, aloha.